Okay, welcome. This is Ad Emmer reporting live with an interview that we normally would have done at ISC. And we are here uh, together with um, Thomas uh, Sterling and Satoshi uh, Machuoko. And we are here to discuss exascale supercomputing developments. So another year on the road to exascale. So welcome, um, Thomas. Welcome, uh, Satoshi. I'm happy that uh, you are here and happy that we can talk again. Okay. Um, so if I look at the uh, past year, well, 2019 was the second half was not that interesting, I guess, I don't know. Uh, but 2020, a lot of things uh, were happening. So uh, Thomas, can you perhaps start with, uh, with telling what for you were the, uh, the highlights? Uh, well, I'm probably not the right person, but the obvious uh, major uh, uh, trends over uh, the certainly the last half year and, and going backwards are on the downside, the worldwide pandemic uh, 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 with COVID-19 or alternatively SARS-CoV-2 uh, as a different uh, term and uh, how the world of high performance computing uh, and this, this spans all continents with the possible exception of Antarctica uh, addressing uh, the uh, means of applying high performance computing uh, to all aspects of uh, the, the pandemic from uh, drug design and understanding the virus itself uh, to the phenomena of distributing uh, uh, how the, how the um, uh, uh, COVID-19 has been transmitted locally and uh, globally. And on the other hand, and I'm not the right person to say this, uh, is that in the area of exit scale, uh, we as a community are asymptotically converging to uh, something that looks like exaflops uh, in a classic way, but quite possibly, and I now can uh, attribute to Satoshi um, and uh, his uh, Rican, uh, Mex, uh, his many colleagues, uh, we in fact have possibly achieved exascale because as I see a, a curious phenomenon, as we get closer to exaflops, we find the definition of exascale is very rapidly becoming richer with a far greater set of different metrics and applications. So it may be premature, but may not to say that this is the year when we can uh, declare uh, exascale in terms of operations, not double precision floating point operations, but operations have been achieved. And of course, uh, uh, explicitly giving uh, once again credit to uh, Japan for uh, rapidly bringing up Fugaki, Fugaku uh, which uh, broke over 400 uh, uh, petaflops R max. So I'll take those two. There are a number of other uh, events that have occurred, but I will bring those up uh, as appropriate. Okay, Satoshi, uh, what were your highlights, uh, according to you, the highlights of, uh, or the important points, I may say, it's not really highlights of the past year? Well, Yes, as Thomas alluded to, and uh, we were able to successfully launch Fugaku as scheduled, uh, despite uh, the difficulties as brought on by this uh, coronavirus spread. You know, there were a lot of challenges, logistical challenges, supply chains, and so forth. But, you know, uh, there, were, uh, there were a lot of heroics that would play with Henrique and then also Fujitsu and other partners. And we were able to um, deliver uh, Fugaku on time. Now, as Thomas said, uh, uh, we like to consider Fugaku as one of the first excess, is the first excess scale machine, not necessarily excess blocks, uh, because, of course, as Thomas said, um, uh, we achieved um, uh, 400 plus cut of blocks. Of course, we could achieve more. In fact, it was not achieved on the full machine, but, uh, but you know, uh, we know the maximum theoretical even if we achieve the maximum theoretical, we would not reach uh, double precision limp back at so far. Um, but having said that, um, uh, two things. One is, of course, um, on the HBL, H the new HBL AI uh, benchmark, which basically 
computes the same result as you would with link pack, but in, in reduced precision, but of course you make corrections to achieve uh, six four bit results. For that uh, benchmark, uh, we achieve 1.4 uh, exaflop, uh, you know, with the, again, with the same result as you would get six four bits. So, you know, that's uh, machine plus the numerical algorithm um, advanced system that allows us to achieve that. And, but more importantly, I think <coughs> that uh, the wish uh, Raku, even now, um, as we bring it up, is uh, achieving uh, application performances that people had expected um, of the Exascale machine. And for Furaku, the, the target goal was never achieving number one on the various benchmarks. You know, we're the first machine to be crowned number one in all of it, essentially all of it performance benchmarks. Um, HBL, HBLII, HPCG, Top 500, and Graph 500. But uh, again, it was never our goal to achieve number one on any of them. Rather, our um, goal was to achieve, um, you know, something uh, two orders of magnitude scale speed up over K computer, which was a 10 petaflop machine. So, and, and then uh, we are uh, achieving that. So, in that sense, um, uh, Fugaku is a Mexico machine, and the, uh, the the excellence and benchmark as achieved is a consequence of, of you know, meeting up with the objectives we had set up for the machine. That is, again, it was an application first design, not benchmark first design, not, not the opposite way. And uh, and also, uh, finally, we gave it to Thomas that COVID-19, of course, it, um, you know, would have uh, significant pose, significant potential hazard to our upbringing of the machine. You know, everybody's locked down. I'm, you know, I'm in my uh, private office now. Of course, we're not locked down anymore, but. We still um, uh, uh, encourage uh, remote work, and as a director of the center, you have to set exemplar, and so that's why I'm in my remote office, and I'm in my main office, and at the at the center. Now, I was there yesterday, but today I'm here, <clears throat> and um, so um, we were able to. Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 there's a significant uh, rural force, the coalition of supercomputers that are being deployed to tackle this um, media crisis that faces the society. And, uh, and we're getting you know, tangible results from that. And from drug design to transmission to even simulating the economic impact of all these lockdowns and, all, and, and the possible mitigation measures thereof. And which would not have been possible without the deploy deployment of these very large machines. And also all the research that's been going on to quickly adapt our simulations and our um, AI and so forth, our methodologies to uh, cope with the situation. So in some sense, um, the HPC community, especially large scale computing has, is really proving its worth to the society. I mean, COVID-19 is bad, it's really bad, no question about that. Uh, but it is uh, allowing um, us, the community to really prove its worth, that it is something important um, and even in these immediate need times immediate needs, not just long-term scientific research. At your presentation, uh, at your keynote, your, your very nice keynote, you give some examples about um, how uh, uh, COVID-19 research uh, catched up and how uh, uh, centers were, were working together. Can you comment on that? Uh, yes, please. And, and let me return initially uh, to uh, Japan and to the operation that Satoshi and other colleagues there are providing uh, leadership uh, the, in two different ways. Uh, first, bringing resources uh, uh, together and making them almost instantaneously available to researchers who have ideas uh, and ways to, uh, to do it, uh, removing uh, the uh, bureaucracy uh, that ordinarily is engaged, uh, providing a fast track. And the other dimension, uh, uh, oh, and I should add to that, uh, bringing um, uh, a diversity of different machines connected uh, to their inter internet uh, system. Um, um, Satoshi will tell us, uh, remind us of what that uh, uh, total aggregate is called. Um, and as I got the numbers, and these may be outdated, uh, at least an aggregate of over 200 petaflops using tier two machines and uh, 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 and then add to that the tier one machine Fugaku 
uh, which, which is approaching uh, uh, exascale uh, by various different metrics. So that's one dimension. The other dimension is the diversity and the uh, singular competence of the research itself. Uh, the diversity in uh, areas of uh, microbiology, in uh, data analysis and testing, the combining of HPC and AI as mutually supportive uh, tools, uh, looking at the, the uh, crisis, as uh, Satoshi put it, uh, and at the global scale and how it's transmitted, and very much at the, at the local scale, trying to develop the drug or drug opportunities uh, using computing uh, to do that. Um, uh, uh, Satoshi can add to that, but, but it's a very rich, it's a very complete uh, attack or campaign against this crisis. Uh, in, the, um, uh, in the US, I, I referred to several of our national laboratories, and I'll repeat them, uh, the Texas Advanced Computing Center in Austin, Texas, uh, which is part of the University of Texas at Austin, uh, NCSA in Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and that's part of uh, the v University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, that, that, by the way, is, is uh, the, the first is run by our colleague and friend Dan Stanzione, uh, and uh, the latter, uh, um, uh, Bill Gropp, uh, is is now um, uh, uh, chairing uh, that, uh, and then the Department of Energy Labs, and I'm only touching on a few, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, I, I interacted with uh, Barney McCabe, who's the chief scientist there, and, uh, and with Argonne National Lab, uh, interacting with uh, some of the uh, colleagues, uh, Rick Stevens, Ian Foster, and so forth. There, there are many other universities uh, that are doing uh, smaller amounts of work, but in uh, I, I can take uh, pride in at least how our professional and our computer systems are being brought to bear. And like Satoshi, like his colleagues, uh, we have developed a fast track uh, method, uh, even at points where something could be turned around in three days. And then in Europe, uh, we, uh, uh, just to mention too, is the ULIC uh, Computing Center with uh, Thomas Lippert and my friend Bernd Moore uh, and others who uh, have identified very similar approaches to expediting uh, the research and the kinds of research that are being done very quickly. And uh, maybe finally uh, at Lugano in Switzerland, uh, our colleague Thomas Schultes, who, who runs that, uh, is um, uh, brought uh, their uh, first tier uh, machines to apply and are using the, uh, both they and ULIC are using the PRACE infrastructure for rapidly uh, guiding um, uh, and connecting the researchers and the research problems to the computers and the computing capability. Uh, and I know there are others I regret. I did not have uh, data um, of our colleagues in China. I can assume that they uh, and others are, are doing uh, um, uh, similar things. Yeah, there was, for instance, also Saudi Arabia at Kaust, where they are uh, using 15% or something from Shanin, but, uh, and there were other examples in the East. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, at Kaust, uh, I, I didn't have a chance uh, to chat with David Keyes, um, uh, with apologies, David, uh, but uh, I, um, I, I uh, understand that their facilities and their research capabilities. I should make that one other point, and I'm sure this is true in uh, Kobe. Uh, it's not just providing the machines or doing the bureaucracy. It is that these different centers are also providing expertise, hands-on expertise, in uh, the programming and debugging and optimizations um, uh, by experts in the field to help the researchers rapidly get their models uh, or, or data uh, running and, and being analyzed. Yeah. Uh, Satoshi, can you perhaps t tell, uh, does it really help? Does it really lead to research that, that now can be done faster and that there are results which otherwise would have taken longer? Yes. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, firstly, uh, to answer to Thomas's um, 
really a question. You know, there are two programs we're running in um, in Japan. One is the, the tier one, the Furaku program, and the second is the tier two, um, the rest of the so-called SBCI, which is our you know, race or BCI. Uh, I'm sorry, I I, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Um, exceed equivalent, you know, coalition of green centers. And um, uh, the tier two program is basically, you know, um, uh, for because these machines are by definition operational. Um, you know, so basically, they are fast tracking, as Thomas said, from application to uh, acceptance. Uh, it's about a week delay, uh, which is you know, significantly shorter uh, compared to um, uh, you know, other you know, normal uh, normal circumstances. Uh, Fugaku is a little, uh, was a little different because Fugaku is not officially deployed yet. In fact, it's still in the midst of development, although we have all the machines inside. In fact, when we started the program, not all the nodes were inside of our premise. It only came in, the last boxes came in May 13th. But even in, in March, of course, we have significant resource um, already in the floor and being tested. And we were getting ready for uh, some of the early test users. And then this whole COVID-19 was struck. And it became cl pretty clear that uh, we, we, you know, we uh, all this tremendous resource uh, fully deployed is several times bigger than the entire Japan, Japanese HPC capability. Uh, even that partially would be uh, put to good use. So we discussed with the ministry, we discussed with stakeholders, we discussed with scientists to basically say, um, you know, can we can we do this? And um, and they need and, and you know you, you would think there will be some pushbacks from people, uh, for example, other early access users who obviously would be compromised, or you know. You know or from companies, you know, whose uh, deployment plans may be compromised. Uh, there were all these sacrifices people have to make. So you expect us some um, uh, pushback, of course, from a ministry, because you know, ministries are usually very bureaucratic about this. And, uh, being on that flagship machine, you have to, you know, you have to be very politically sensitive and all that. But uh, in the end, everybody thought it was a good idea. Everybody collaborated, no complaints, people were gung-ho. And we quickly, you know, set up the program set up the procedure, set people up the machine, and of course, as Thomas said, um, we provided um, uh, priority expertise of our operations and tuning teams to these, uh, these scientists. And, you know, they're up and running. And um, that's, and, and the combined, uh, the maximum combined capability is somewhere around, you know, um, depends on time of the day. And sometimes they can't get all the resources, sometimes they can, but yeah, but it's in the order of stuff. At least if you want to put up off peak of people deployed, you know, exploit the resource in its entirety, of course, it's, it's very hard to do that. Um, then a question about uh, regarding ad. And um, uh, did it, is it really helping? Yes, uh, um, uh, by all means, yes. Um, because many of the simulations, especially on Fugaku, um, the ones on tier two machines are smaller, although some same people may be running on. There are about 12 of them, I think, right now. Um, as uh, the last I counted, and forgot there was five or five projects. But the ones on tier two machines are obviously smaller. And uh, uh, it's, but the tier one, so Fugaku had to be something, you know, that was that would be worthwhile running on Fugaku. And um, uh, but you know, scientists, you know, the application people, uh, the teams basically are exploiting the machine to a, a, a great extent, to, in a way such that it would not have been possible. To get any of the results in meaningful time in the existing infrastructure, like what kind of sets the cake uh, uh, So, for example, one of the, um, you know, one of the uh, molecular simulations, uh, this, this is first principle molecular overall calculation using uh, what's called FML, which is a, a highly parallel uh, Schrodinger equations calculations using the FML, um, what's called the FML method. Uh, they are reporting um, over 100 times speed up running the same code on, on K as opposed to Fugaku in a reasonable capacity they can usually obtain. So they have cut down their uh, compute time from a month, a few months, to just few, few hours. Okay. And so this is giving them considerable um, advantage in terms of turnaround time games to explore the nature of these uh, uh, the viruses, study the nature of viruses. 
the other example I can give is, um, you know, the, so there's uh, another research group that's doing all sort of a, all, you know, taking the existing drugs to see if there are if they are effective against these drug targets. And, and but the, even in Japan, there are about, about 2,100 approved drugs. So uh, in the UK, it would have been infeasible to just go and you know, try them all. In fact, um, the methods that the researcher are using is based on uh, first principle molecular dynamics. So you know, again, this is um, not as that not as expensive as for the orbital, but molecular dynamics is still very expensive. So it would be very, it would have been very difficult to conduct this on a small machine because you know uh, they were given this uh, huge resource of the they could just sweep at least for one a few of the targets they were able to do the complete sweep and uh, they were able to identify some uh, uh, drugs um, that are effective um, which were no which uh, in some of the trials or uh, like or in, in vitro um, uh, experiments they thought or people have thought it could be effective but that they didn't have any evidence or knowledge as to why or the effectiveness, or the potential effectiveness. But now it's um, been proven that this, that uh, some of these drugs have really high affinity to uh, to attach to the, to the to the targets. And these are not you know, these are not even like the antiviral drug, viral drug. They are completely different drugs. But it turns out that these may be effective. And again, this was already published, but these were sort of like more. Expert, uh, just done in based on empirical experiments, but now we have scientific evidence to prove that this is you know, this may be effective because uh, because we see this molecular we see this behavior at the molecular level. But then, of course, you know, there's um, um, uh, we are doing lots of analysis on um, uh, um, aerosol and droplet uh, um, dispersions because you know people cough, um, people. Wearing masks, not wearing masks. What's the social distance? How uh, how do we do the ventilation, room ventilation? You know, uh, are crowded train trains dangerous? All these uh, there are lots of issues. Um, you know, what are the preventive measures? How can you know, restaurants reopen with these measures? Do they have to keep distance or can the shields? Are there? Um, how high the shield should be? You know, there are all these things people we simply don't know. Again, um, we're running extensive sets of simulations, um, built by air conditioning and also construction companies. And, uh, and we're finding some um, very meaningful results, and uh, that's leading to, uh, that has uh, leading to some government guidelines with respect to these um, uh, coronavirus uh, mitigation measures in, in the social setting, like the how high you know, how high do you want the shields, these uh, partitions to be, for example. So yeah, and uh, yeah, and finally, I think um, the rapidness. It's only been like a couple months since we started this. Right? Um, the whole program started at the beginning. Of the April. Both programs started at the beginning. Of the April. And um, but we're getting some really tangible, meaningful scientific results, which are in some ways groundbreaking. Well, at least think they're something that's really, really useful. And. Uh, and in some cases, this was there was some serendipitous, um, uh, I would say, serendipitous uh, transformation. Just like you apply a different drug, you know, totally different drug to which happened to be effective to coronavirus. The same is same thing is happening to happening to these simulations themselves as well. So, for example, this uh, droplet aerosol simulation. This was already mentioned in my COVID-19 talk that I see. The team that's doing this, they were experts in engine, uh, you know, internal combustion engines. And uh, they were simulating lots of stuff, including the, the fuel injectors. So, you know, you have a fuel injector, you, you know, you spray gasoline into, into the engine, and of course it combusts it, and then it evaporates it. And then uh, and you light it up and it explodes, and that's how you do engine, that's how engines work. But they found that uh, the same physics apply to droplets and air as well, because it's you know it's liquid, micro droplets of liquid in air. So uh, they quickly transferred their 
methodologies to adapt to the new parameters. And they put in some new elements like they put in the, the actual coronavirus counts into the droplets and so forth. And then, of course, they worked with the experts um, in the area. And they quickly came up with these simulation results. So it's, in some sense, it was serendipitous. A uh, uh, team that has been working on a totally different subject just happened to have the right, uh, right solutions uh, to uh, mitigate uh, coronavirus. So um, I found that uh, very fascinating. In some cases, of course, people have working for years on uh, you know, things like drug design and so forth. But even, even then, people are trying these new methods, which is giving them some serendipitous um, uh, results, which were not expected. And then even there's even a factor which is totally serendipitous different branches of science. Really. And again, it's really interesting that this is all being driven by this uh, high point computing and all the research that's been done. You know, it's been very impressive, you know, a few months that we are actually doing the right science and you know, not for the mankind that we can, that's useful. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to, uh, to, to see that all. And um, I would also be interested, especially in the droplet uh, research, because uh, I want to know whether I can travel safely by train or not. So uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, but let's go back to the, uh, to, to the systems. Um, Thomas, you mentioned in your talk that, uh, that um, you see three types of systems in the, let's say, top 500. Uh, the very big ones, the big ones, and basically all the rest. Um, uh, how do you see the, 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 the usability of those uh, three types? And can you tell a little bit more about that? Uh, certainly. Um, uh, first, let me say that uh, that work, uh, which has gone on for a number of years uh, with uh, my colleagues, is based on the very fine data that Eric Strohmeyer of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab had been preparing presenting for literally decades. Uh, and uh, this, uh, of course, includes uh, Jack Bengara and, um, and Horst uh, Simon, uh, and up until recent years, uh, the late Hans Mauer. Uh, so we're uh, mining uh, this. And the, the key outcome of that uh, uh, minor study is that uh, the supercomputing availability is not evenly divided across the two orders of magnitude performance range, as you might anticipate from the uh, original presentation curve from the number one machine uh, down to the number 500 machine. Again, that's roughly, and it changes slightly, two orders of magnitude. Uh, and, and that's uh, been remarkably steady uh, over the over the more than two decades. Uh, what, what instead we found is that uh, these, and this is a popular thing, right? Uh, these uh, systems really cluster. And I know they're clustered systems in many cases, but the, the, mm -hmm. they, are, they, they seem to be either falling into what category we'll refer to as mainstream. Uh, uh, one uh, other is leadership. And then there's this uh, third area between the two, not very many machines in that area, and I don't think we've ever come up with a, a decent term for that. The important takeout is that HPC, the field, uh, both in terms of uh, product development and in application usage, uh, tends to fall in these three areas. More than 90% of all the machines on the top 500 seem to be within a factor of four of, um, of the number of top 500, the, the 500, excuse me, 500 uh, machine. So most of us, not, um, not Satoshi uh, and a few uh, special people, but most of us work in that lower few percentile of um, uh, peak uh, capacity that's provided. We've also found that the leadership machines, which get a lot of the, um, uh, press, and deservedly so, uh, such as Fugaku, uh, the total number of machines is always within the top 10. And that, that's a, that would have surprised me. They don't reach into the, the top 20. And, and then there's these intermediate machines uh, where, uh, such as uh, ones we have, the one we have at Indiana University, uh, we're putting into place a, a new Cray um, uh, Shasta 
machine. And that's just beginning to be at this uh, um, in, uh, fairly rapid increase. And that's only across uh, at most uh, 10 to 15 of those machines. What this means is that we have a community that serves very different operating points. We should acknowledge that and uh, we should apply them, both support them in terms of software tools and environment where people really need co uh, confidence in what they're using because that's where most of the machines. And then as, as uh, Kobe is doing um, and uh, our friends at ULIC, et cetera, uh, show uh, how by really stretching the capabilities that we can uh, in fact do remarkable things otherwise. Uh, the, uh, so the, the one message is there really are three classes of machines and they do cluster tightly. And the other um, uh, is that this has been a continuing, a steady state uh, condition for well over two decades. So we can rely on, on the reality of it. It doesn't mean that machines haven't been changing. Uh, uh, others have done this. We found that uh, a number of one machine uh, eight years from then would be a number 500 machine if they're kept on uh, that long. Okay, can you comment on that Satoshi? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, Observation, of course, I'll, I'll also look at the Earth's data since it comes to stock and so forth. Um, you know, in, when we started the exascale endeavor maybe over 10 or even over 10 years ago, there were a lot of uh, questions as to whether we would have some tangible applications that we running on these machines. Maybe not the whole machine, but you know, at least, you know, um, even, uh, even so, this. Uh, even a small portion of such a machine would be so social modernist. They would be using, you know, hundreds of thousands of cores. You know, on Fugaku, a hundred thousand core job is standard. So it's, yeah, so, you know, it's a, you know, my times have changed. And um, so um, there, there are a lot of questions whether, whether it would be uh, viable. But what, as Thomas points out, what's interesting thing Thomas points out is, you know, things this. Oh, there have been some changes. I think there are more uh, bigger machines. Uh, there is more concentration of the, of the performance on bigger machines and so forth. But by and large, um, you know, the applications have shifted. You know, there are new applications coming in, uh, obviously. But uh, you know, uh, people have found uses for these big machines, and the application that have been running on these big machines are now uh, shifted to uh, lower tier machines and so forth. So, you know, this uh, continued um, uh, performance uh, and the scale, of, uh, the scale of the machine growing, this continued path, um, I wouldn't say without effort, of course, there are a lot of efforts involved, but still uh, continue to um, uh, demonstrate the utility of these machines for a wide range of applications. So here we feel excellent. Again, 10 years ago, even people some people, even some of experts, I wouldn't name them, but people actually, who are actually building executable machines now, um, planning executable machines now, even said, well, we only have like, one or two kind of applications to skip, so we need to have some justification. So there are some people saying, but now, you know, people don't say that. We, don't, you know, we do have you know, a variety of uh, credible applications that can benefit from these executable uh, like machines, and of course, this downstream, so to uh, small machines uh, all the time. So that's um, so that's pretty amazing. You know, we've been able to not just sustain the growth of the machine, but the growth of the applications. And, uh, keep pace with the uh, 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 the applications, keeping pace with the growth of the performance. That's pretty amazing. The second thing is, um, uh, is one of the reasons why China has such a dominance, at least in terms of the number of units, um, in in. Is a uh, you know, number of machines per share, country share, um, or vendor share is because they put up all these machines, which we don't know if they're, if they're really supercomputers, but they're actually in the cloud, but they do so in or in some in-house uh, machine, but they do so that they put it on any, put them on any. Um, whereas in the US or in Japan, um, uh, these private entities may not be listed these machines. And so one demonstration of this, was uh, you know Microsoft's just uh, 
few weeks prior to ISC announced that they are have put together this very large machine, uh, which is they keep moving. Uh, but uh, in terms of raw performance, uh, it uh, really within top five, other than the top 100 list. And, you know, and uh, I think some of the press reports that they have more than 10,000 GPUs and so forth. And you know, that's the and you know, so they were, you know, their claim was obviously substantiated by their uh, scale of the machine. Of course, they're using this for mostly for their AI stuff, but probably using for others. And I know other companies that actually have similar type of capabilities. Uh, they, don't, they don't just announce them. And um, these types of very large infrastructures um, making their way into private sectors is actually um, not represented on the market, but they are definitely there. And uh, actually, that's, um, that's driving the market because HPC market is, at, is, is increasing by a much higher percentage than the other branches of IT. And um, uh, some of these are reflected on the top 500, some are not. And, um, uh, 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 but uh, obviously, um, the companies are not, you know, uh, are keenly aware that these um, computing capabilities are, uh, are very credible instruments to drive their business. So, you know, there used to be uh, you know, for these bigger machines, what Thomas calls the, 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 the flagship, or maybe even a second tier, but you know, sort of the bigger cluster, you know, two top cluster machine. It used to be, we used to say, most of the industries in the lower tier, the, the lower cluster. But now we have industries putting up these machines, um, so they are becoming uh, as, uh, uh, a turn of force. Other than the countries competing against each other, like. With government, big government sponsored machines like Ferrari or you know, Summit or you know, Sierra or you know, Yante and so forth. And now we have the private sectors who are coming in and putting up their, their big machines. And, um, uh, and that's becoming a, uh, something not necessarily reflected on the top 500, but hopefully we can capture by some of these. Okay. Yeah, for instance, you also see that in the top 10, there are now two machines in industry, uh, one from INA and one from uh, NVIDIA itself. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of them, yeah, some of them. Some, yeah. Right, they list the machine, but some don't. And yeah. the competitive reasons, but uh, they're certainly there. The big machines are in the industry. Well. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we uh, talk a little bit uh, architecture? So, um, uh, Thomas, can you start with telling what you see there? Uh, yes, so I would say that there are uh, two important trends, and I'm going to once again start with Kugaku, so I feel ill, Ill uh, prepared, but uh, Satoshi will correct me. Uh, I, you know, uh, this may be an exaggeration, but I think the deployment, and especially the rapid deployment of Kugaku, reminds me of uh, uh, the Earth simulator moment. Uh, when, when uh, that's a long time ago, right? I think uh, you and I were in uh, Santorini. I may be wrong. Um, I was in high school. <laughs> <you're>... <laughs> oh dear. Um, uh, Earth Simulator uh, uh, really uh, re ex escaped from the the trap of uh, roughly small increment in changes and was the first major machine to hit 40 teraflops. Um, I was giving a keynote address at uh, uh, Osako, I may have that wrong, University uh, in, in uh, Shenzhen. Uh, but um, uh, this is equally important. We have to give credit, among other things, to the work of Fujitsu. And they are the first uh, to bring uh, a machine based on ARM processors uh, to, um, to a large-scale machine. This has been discussed for years and years, principally in Europe, certainly interest in the U.S., but um, uh, the, the Fugaku is a major, major machine. But in addition to that, of course, is their own custom um, uh, accelerator, um, SVE are, are the, the letters that come to mind uh, that are ring. And finally, uh, the Fugaku machine is um, uh, really good interconnection technologies and techniques. This was also true, in my opinion, with K, 
where there was a lot of bandwidth. And that bandwidth really helped uh, Kay, and I presume Will on Fugaku, be able to do many other problems and simply, uh, and do them well, even record-breaking, than um, uh, the, um, uh, mo mo most of the machines because of the tight coupling, the very high bandwidth, and frankly, the just exceptional engineering uh, that these machines have. So, um, uh, and I, I am sure Satoshi can add to that, but let me just say one other thing that is happening. I didn't have uh, much time to talk about this in my keynote, uh, but uh, we are beginning to see traction and interest in heterogeneous computing uh, beyond the uh, uh, bimodal uh, GPU plus uh, group of uh, CPU, multi-core CPU chips in a particular node and then tied together to a network. And um, uh, I, I only really know the work that's going on in the US, but there are literally dozens of special purpose chips that are being developed right now principally, but not uniquely by startup companies uh, to ex um, expedite uh, at much lower cost, lower energy and higher reliability. And, and those are important points for these, um, these cases uh, in the areas of what we're calling AI today. We discussed this um, uh, a year or two ago uh, uh, to uh, bring the price down so that uh, many more problems can be uh, addressed. But uh, pr before that, there was uh, uh, effort to do a number of um, startup special purpose or domain specific chip for Bitcoin uh, and, uh, and other things. So there is now uh, expanding, building on uh, what makes a GPU uh, almost like general purpose uh, with additional, additional uh, um, added accelerators, um, most of which will die. Uh, uh, for as as you know, startups, uh, but some of which will not, and even the ones that die will point the way towards future. Now, our, our friends at uh, Oak Ridge have been a big supporter of heterogeneous computing. Uh, I myself have tended to try to push back on that, but to be honest, I am myself developing um, a, a domain-specific machine that is more uh, memory-intensive. So I guess I have swallowed my pride and. Um, and uh, looked at it. Um, I would say that I would have expected more, uh, more hard developments out of Europe by now than I have seen. We certainly have the capability and um, uh, I'm expecting to see more out of China uh, quite possibly next year. Uh, uh, as this. Of course, uh, as, as Satoshi has pointed out, Fugaku has got legs and uh, we'll be seeing uh, much more interesting numbers uh, from them. So, so uh, one, one final example of domain specific, which I did mention in my presentation, was uh, the uh, IBM chip, the neuromorphic uh, computing chip with something in excess of 5 billion transistors. It's a spiking model of neuromorphic, but it's pure digital. And um, yeah, by some metric, which I haven't fully internalized, it incorporates a million uh, uh, neurons uh, by, by whatever definition that is. Uh, so uh, the good news is that there are applications in, in um, uh, pattern matching uh, and associative searching uh, and and uh, even planning some NP hard problems and putting the gains aside. Uh, that's the good news for this and I look forward to seeing those results. The bad news is that um, we're building machine where we don't even really understand the paradigm of what thinking is and ultimately these are in, intended to uh, move and to provide uh, the mechanism or the appearance of thinking in 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 rocks, as as my friends would say. So I just cite that as an interesting example, if for no other reason, simply the scale. It's like the second largest uh, chip, uh, and it and it is it is uh, scalable. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Satoshi. Yeah. Well. Uh, well. Thank you for all the compliments, Thomas. I think. Um, 
No, that was a very intensive 10 years work between uh, Pizza and Rika, and I was involved from, from day one and kind of involved in various matters through the whole way. Now, of course, I'm responsible for it. So, um, yeah, so I know uh, uh, a lot of the core details of how the project went on. And there were a lot of crises in between, and uh, you know how we, I know how we always end them. And, yeah, um, in the end, uh, in some ways, in the end, I think we did the right thing, and uh, we built the machine that we had anticipated. Most of them, by and large, anticipated ten years ago, actually. So. Um, so it you know, gives us a really good feeling of what we are today. We had envisioned for uh, 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 what exoskeleton would look like. Uh, we had actually realized that was in the 2018 U.S. The DARPA report it was in our report. We had written uh, uh, around the same time. Now, uh, uh, but of course, it was done with lots of very pristine engineering. And um, uh, you know, what sets uh, Fulaku apart from uh, K computer, of course, there are lots of similarities because the design is that uh, we have compared to, for example, what Thomas mentioned with data connect. Certainly, it's, it's an evolution of a token network um, that was in K that's involved with token E. It has some more features, it's faster and so forth. Uh, but, you know, the, the network in K was ultra fast to begin with. So, um, there weren't, um, so it wasn't. Uh, uh, it was something that we uh, inherited uh, for this for this generation. Uh, on the other hand, there were uh, lots of shortcomings in K. Uh, for example, the chip itself was not was only marginally competitive to let's say other CPUs at the time. We did lots of comparative benchmarks against more popular CPUs, and we found they were uh, not a very large um, performance advantage. Then you want, you know, then you say, you know, what's the, why the point one is just go buy off the shelf. Um, we found that, uh, you know, the power profile was not, you know, was, we had to make significant improvements. In, in fact, we didn't say it like that at the time, but we need to make something like almost like GPU level uh, perform, um, power uh, efficiency metric um, in order to reach our target goal. A building machine within this power envelope and space and cost and so forth. And that was, again, very, very difficult target. Uh, because K was sort of, again, the, the power you know, efficiency of K was sort of nominal. Again, kind of compared to other cost solutions. So that didn't really be fair. And then we had to do it in the, uh, with the constraint that um, it's general purpose. We couldn't rely on. Uh, we, uh, we looked at the profile of many applications, and except for uh, vectorization, which we knew very well, because, uh, and, and also it would entail for the AVX, which is vectorization, GPUs are vectors. And, um, you know, we have classic vector machine, including Earth's later. So we know how to vector. So vectorization is an te acceleration technology we know very well. So that's one thing we could use, but we couldn't use anything, including anything else in, uh, from a compute point of view. So, um, so that was um, uh, that was a big challenge uh, because uh, other than that, we had to build a general purpose processor, which would have a very large self ecosystem. And that's why we picked R. And um, uh, of course, there was a big fight whether to continue with Spark or uh, to adopt R because, of course, you know, that's, there's a whole that's a complete switch over the software rules and tool chain for the G2, but um, but we want out. But again, you know, uh, having these three elements co coincide, you know, this ultimate, you know, extreme high performance, extreme high efficiency, and, and the extremely general purpose, so general purpose you can run on you know, how you know, Windows and Word at that level of generality uh, was a very, very tough goal to achieve. Uh, but, you know, but I'm so very happy to say we've done that. So it's about whose value is not just with the with the performance, it's the, you know, it's the flexibility in general. So that's good. Now, uh, so the question, so that's the machine we have here today. And we demonstrated that. And there are lots of you know, big GPU machines out there. And, you know, and Thomas said GPUs are not quite, but almost, you know, they're very, very general purpose, right? Um, uh, they're not as general purpose as a CPU, but you know, there's abundant software stack. Uh, and um, 
we have to appreciate and, uh, and honor and applaud the efforts of people like Nvidia who spend more money, I think, uh, in enriching the software ecosystem than uh, putting in the hardware. I mean, that's, again, they've learned the lesson of how computer architectures die. And then, uh, then, you know, then they're doing all they can to, you know, not just to rest on the performance advantage, but to enrich the software system, ecosystem, you can actually use it. Um, so, uh, so you know, GPU systems are uh, still very dominant at the top, and for very good reason. And uh, so, you know, so you know, people have a choice: of are they going to completely general purpose and case of quite or you know, get a little bit of more performance advantage? Or in some cases, it's easy to program these parallel uh, parallel architectures for some problems rather than factorization. So, GPUs are not all that bad to program. For some for some apps, so then it go to GPU, right? And uh, that's perfectly sensible. So those are the two two major uh, types of computing paradigms we have right now. Now, um, so what, what, what the question? Where do we go from here? And um, so we've been thinking really deeply about this for the past several years, even before the rock was complete. Um, and um, but yeah, the good news is has. We are getting these new machines on the floor, and we're measuring them and being able to program them. Um, and, and and these are good machines. You know, they're exploiting, you know, that that like new Ampere GPU, both the Volta and Ampere GPU. They're really pristine architecture. They're really well designed. They have really high efficiency. So they're not like you know, old GPUs. They're really high efficient, well designed, they're really very well designed engineers. As always, I see for you know, They're not like, I don't know, like five, something five, which had really poor efficiency, very badly designed. You know, and, that, and that's a consequence of that. But, you know, the, the A square Quack uh, you know, from a very high altitude may look very similar, but actually, the efficiency of engineering of the chip is totally different. So, um, so people have very good choices. But now we have them, and we have the applications, and we have the uh, and we have studied heterogeneous computing um, for a long time. Uh, and I have a feeling that we are starting to get a really good grasp of, uh, of the positives and negatives and what we can expect to see and uh, what we hope to see, but we may not see yet. So uh, I can't really go into the deep dive into details of the one somewhere. It's still so research secret. But, um, but yeah, um, can, even compared to 10 years ago, when people said heterogeneous computing, um, I think we're getting um, a really good understanding of the strengths and weaknesses and the limits and the possibilities and limitations of uh, heterogeneous computing um, from the architectural standpoint, from the performance standpoint, from the transistor standpoint, all the hardware devices stuff, and the programming standpoint. And um, yeah, so uh, it's very exciting times because now. Um, in the past, we said heterogeneous computing would let it go, but it was more of a uh, more of a blanket statement. Thing. But now uh, that we have these artifacts and that we have much deeper understanding, we're at a point where we have to be, as we design the next generation machine beyond machines like we have to, have to be really uh, cognizant of the selection of uh, heterogeneous heterogeneity that we put into the system, what we are not. We should not put the system because they are not useful. Yeah, so uh, we're approaching that. We're actually at that approaching, or even at that point, or some, or something. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, on one hand, it's quite interesting. On the other hand, uh, it tells you that we have uh, we're sort of transcending the phase of these uh, uh, this uh, let all the flowers bloom, heterogeneous uh, computing base to more mature, a little bit more mature. Um, you know, sort of uh, on the path to uh, uh, to more, I would say, um, more comprehensive, uh, uh, more general, uh, more widespread public um, uh, uh, deployment of these. So, um, and again, there are various forces at play. Uh, your smartphone is uh, actually a heterogeneous monster. Or any of your latest smartphone has a whole bunch of these components, so that's the sort of thing. But is it applicable to uh, more general purpose machines like supercomputers or machines in the cloud? Uh, people are not quite sure. 
that he could assume. Uh, these spark points have rolled, very rolled upon the world clothes. Rails on these seven more general purpose and very large little systems that they, they may not. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's very exciting times for we go. Okay. Um, yeah, in, in, in Europe, for instance, you see the uh, EPI uh, development, European Processor Initiative, where they try to put a platform on a chip with the uh, ARM chip as the core, and then you can add a RISC, uh, RISC V processor uh, as accelerator, and you can add FPGA, etc. Is that part of the um, heterogeneity, or is that not what you're pointing at? Well, well, I think it's it's more to do with the fundamentals of uh, uh, exactly identifying what we are trying to compute for a system. Mm -hmm. like, uh, what, exactly what these app, what these application algorithms are trying to compute versus you know what are the implications in terms of the uh, transistor budgets and wirings and what's required. And uh, what are the benefits, and what are the what are the budgets required in terms of power, and so forth? So all these are starting to be much more comprehensively um, uh, linked together in the engineering fashion, rather than just saying that yeah, we're going to go to genius and just slap on FPGA. That's good. Um, so, um, so in some sense, we're maturing, but uh, but it's a very uh, delicate procedure. Because we have to have an exact understanding of what we very even microscopic uh, understanding of what we're trying to compute. And in some cases, some of the folklores of have been computed um, in some of our research was trying to really disprove as not being true in new applications. So, um, so um, providing a platform, yes, that's a good that's a good measure because you can adapt. But that's not a panacea. Yeah, that's just for a platform. What's really important is what you put in. Yeah. What you put in there, having a good understanding of what you put in there. And that's where I think for the understanding is uh, we're starting to really understand the problem. Okay. Um, do you have anything to comment on that, uh, Thomas? Or? Uh, uh, well, briefly, I, 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 first of all, I, I agree, of course, to, with Satoshi. Uh, and a very important thing, he didn't quite use the word, but is intrinsic to everything he's just said and that the development of uh, these uh, leadership machines that will serve for a long time and be a significant budget item uh, must be done responsibly. And responsibly means that they have to be advanced, but they have to be advanced based on uh, foundational analysis and simulation uh, so that you don't end up with, well, you know, a mistake machine. Uh, so I, I truly respect that, and uh, that's also uh, what's being done by HPE and or um, uh, their new division, Cray. Uh, I, how, however, uh, and now I'll go out on a limb for a moment, also recognize, and by the way, this is consistent with the concerns that Satoshi had, but maybe a different methodology, is to recognize that uh, that we are at a stage, it's amazing we've gotten through this whole discussion and not once have we said end of Moore's law. Uh, and uh, because maybe we word yet. What, what did he say? I didn't hear it. Okay. Uh, you want to repeat it, Satoshi? End of Moore's law. Yes. End of oh, end of Moore's law. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah end of Moore's law. law. Right. We've, we've avoided cliche very nicely here. I credit yeah, all yeah, of yeah. us. Uh, but but the fact is that um, there are alternative means of organizations of elements that um, may at least uh, liberate uh, our future designs, uh, again, within the scope of responsibility that Satoshi is talking about, uh, to uh, uh, extract uh, uh, opportunities within the design space and the limitations of the technologies to get significant advantages that we're not yet doing because of our intrinsic underlying assumptions. And the one I will mention, and I'm not going to advocate it, I just want to bring it to attention, is that uh, we, um, uh, we continue to base uh, our decades of machines on the underlying uh, uh, features and factors of the von Neumann paradigm, of the von Neumann model, uh, 
although the derivative certainly would seem to be much changed from the original ones, many of uh, the specific constraints that were optimal in the first few decades have become less so now. We continued this because of the exponential growth of semiconductor technology, but we've, we're going over the top of that knee of the curve. So I'm expecting that future, um, if there are accelerators, they won't just be numeric, uh, uh, moving the bits around in order to minimize uh, the succession of latencies between uh, uh, serial uh, ALUs, uh, but rather that they will re reassess uh, the potential organizations that may be done differently. This is not imminent. Uh, I'll throw out neuromorphic computing simply as an example, uh, and uh, well, uh, and, and more far out example might be uh, quantum computing, uh, but uh, I'm not in the position to argue that this time. So I simply want to say that there is potential done professionally and responsibly for the, the kinds of studies that Satoshi is talking about that may lead us beyond the conventional and, and may move us into uh, new uh, optimality spaces of design. Uh, but I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, I think we, uh, we, uh, we have uh, discussed uh, uh, applications, architecture, the current status. So if that's fine, then we have only one topic left, and that is um, the future. Where will we be in one year from now? Will we have exascale and who will, where will we have exascale? Will the, the way that we do research have been changed? Uh, definitely because of COVID. So where will we be in one year from now? And of course, I hope that we will be in Frankfurt, but that's just part of the... Yes, I want my, I want my children here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So, Thomas... Oh my God, yes, <laughs> yes, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thomas, can you start or... For, or... Yeah, uh, one year from now. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's Satoshi and his team, Riken and Fu uh, Jitsu and so forth, will uh, be completing the deployment of their machine and exercising it. And I won't be at all surprised if it continues to be number one uh, on the on the list. Uh, Japanese machines tend to stay up there. It's it's a beautiful piece of engineering, uh, and so it gives us a spotlight. On, on the one year time frame in the Amer in the US uh, we are uh, ex uh, expecting to have anywhere from one to three machines that uh, in some sense qualify as exascale or exaflop there is the uh, the background program the exascale computing project uh, which isn't producing a machine but is producing technology hardware and software and methodologies to contribute to others uh, there is uh, the Aurora 21 machine uh, that will be or should be deployed at Argonne National Lab that uh, according to U.S. Uh, programs right now is expected to be the U.S. first um, uh, Exaflops RMAX machine and very well could be operating by then. Uh, and then uh, there are at least two other machines within the U.S. Uh, in the one to two exaflops range RMAX uh, that are being planned for uh, Oak Ridge National Labs and for Lawrence Livermore uh, National Labs. Uh, and these are, these are planned out. I don't know if they either or both will be online. The next time we speak, I hope we speak in Frankfurt. Um, and uh, I, for, for me, the Chinese are a secret. Um, I don't know what their next delivery will be. Uh, I've only heard rumors and I'm not going to repeat them because they're unsubstantiated. Uh, and Europe, um, uh, there's not a sense that a uh, leading machine, uh, a new leading machine will emerge within the narrow time space of, um, of uh, <coughs> Uh, one year, 
And then I'll simply, uh, at the risk of redundancy, repeat that I think we're going to see some new special purpose chips that are optimized for certain kinds of computing. Uh, the, the results from them will be interesting. I'm not going to claim whether they will succeed or not, but I think it will enrich in the space of consideration. And finally, um, uh, there is, although it hasn't been mentioned much, there is continuing progress incremental in the areas of both uh, neuromorphic and quantum computing. And I look forward to saying more about that. Uh, and uh, Japan is certainly playing a major role in the, in the quantum area. Uh, Satoshi, I'm less familiar with uh, the work going on in, in your country uh, in neuromorphic. So that, those would be my, my closing comments. Okay, Satoshi. Okay, uh, okay, so my crystal ball will be, um, if we, of course, as Thomas mentioned, will, you know, rock will be, be stable operational by then, and uh, we may actually see more details of the U.S. exascale machines. We don't really know exactly when they'll be actually deployed and put the input thing into this full entity, but at least uh, hopefully we can see more details. I mean, they're being slowly real, but, um, um, uh, you know, they're not, um, uh, and we, of course, from background, we know some of the details, but they're not public, many of the details are not public yet. And maybe we, we may or may not see the Chinese machines, uh, we will see, um, uh, they used to be much more open, but of course, for, I don't know, for various political reasons, one or the other, uh, they are much more closed now as they have in the past. So, um, uh, so um, they're, they're quite mysterious. I'm sure you know, they're working on uh, various machines. Um, it's just unknown when they will actually be deployed because it's not easy. Um, for example, in Fukuyaku, uh, the first chip came out in 2018, May of 2018. Uh, so, and then you know, it takes two years for that to uh, deploy the full machine. I mean, that's the magnitude of the efforts that's required from a machine that, from, from a chip that booted. Linux from day one. Uh, there are a few bucks, of course, but basically yeah. booted uh, 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 a large operating system from, from day one and say zero state. Still to the full machine, building the full machine uh, has taken two years and still take another year to, to a point. So it's a, it's a huge endeavor. So, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy, um, especially when you don't know the details. It's not, we don't know if the details are not there. Because things aren't there, or they're just so people, so we don't know. But uh, hopefully, we'll see some details from the, um, for Europe. I think uh, we'll see more visibility in the pre system machines because they do have problems in pre system uh, using existing technologies. So you may yeah. see some some uh, uh, fairly large machines using existing technologies, uh, mostly probably in the U.S. Maybe some from Japan derivative, maybe. But we'll see about that. Uh, but, you know, there will be sort of, uh, from te technological standpoint, there will not be really that new people uh, yeah, be exercising the existing technologies. Uh, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's good news for Europe because have, uh, there will be some sizable capacity. But, um, but I think most important, there are two most important things. I think um, there will be a lot of, um, uh, uh, one is, of course, as I already mentioned, there will be uh, a lot of learning experience from this COVID, as any part of society had been, um, uh, to uh, you know, in how we contributed to actually solving these problems, or how we go to work together, and uh, or how we do things in a very solid fashion. So those may have some effect on uh, the, uh, on these various programs. We'll see what they will be. It certainly, has, it has affected us. So um, uh, we'll see how this, uh, you know. If anything good will come out, well, I wouldn't say good, but if anything positive will come out um, of this whole crisis, um, it's to um, accelerate and improve the way we do uh, uh, supercomputing for the rest of the And then um, the other is, you know, when we build machines, um, it's already done. When you, because everything has to be, the blueprint has to be there when we actually start to manufacture. So for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, hardware for the software is still in, in, in some development going on and applications as well. But from a hardware 
perspective, uh, most of the uh, Yaku developed in part in the 2017. So, so, and we knew most of the characteristics in 18 because we would have a chip because of like that. We always have simulators because of that. I mean, we have um, lots of simulations on the simulator. We had the chip and, you know, we, you know, we started testing applications from very early on, so we knew exactly how much people would be with respect to those applications. And, um, and it turns out many of our performance projections were correct. Well, at least to some to some extent, they were pretty precise. So um, we're doing the right engineering, but you know that's more about you doing engineering, and and so that's why you know, even before that we really start thinking about what's the next, um, because it's already done with you know, with, think, with some of the bigger ideas about the machines, machine and uh, uh, big, uh, a lot of stuff from a couple years ago with the first idea. So now that we have these uh, countries are deploying these very large scale, uh, the, the exascale machines, finally, after many years of uh, endeavor, um, we are, we'll start thinking intensively about what to do next. What are the ideas? I mean, I mean in fact, we're already doing that. But uh, the activity as a, as a whole, in a very holistic fashion, Will become uh, pretty prominent, uh, especially in research space. So some, you know, so some people still may come up with wacky ideas, and they may be pretty good, at least partially. And of course, you have to do the, you know, this uh, really uh, uh, steady engineering, um, do much more extensive analysis. Now that we have these machines, we have better understanding of how to use them. So, so we have to do the right engineering as well. So you know, there's research. Um, still, you know, there's still some research because there are some things that certain differences um, really have always happening. And this time it's mostly AI that happened after, as an afterthought after we talked about that, um, that's the scale. So that's why these uh, AI features are having added to the chips. Right. Uh, no, it's in, it's in the ASIC it's in, it's in the GPUs and so forth. But, you know, we didn't envision that back in um, 2010. But now it's there. So there, there will always be some serendipitous um, uh, elements that will go into these architectures for increased performance. But by and large, um, uh, so so there are some research there. On the other hand, we really have to again we have to do some really uh, uh, I would say very tight engineering. So um, so those will really um, start to happen. Um, and become very visible. So, um, so next year hopefully will be even more exciting because these uh, because we will be toying around with these large you know, We're starting to toy around with these extra machines, and for their own sake, but also toying around to think about the next one. So, uh, it should be pretty exciting. Yeah, 2020 leading up to 21 should be pretty exciting. Okay, well, looking forward to talk to you uh, in one year time in, uh, well, then in Frankfurt, uh, hopefully, yeah. Yes, um, I need my sausage and sauerkraut. Yeah, and the beer, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. you get yeah. beer, but yeah, you don't get too sausage. Yeah, but it's, it's different, it's different if you taste it there than if you taste it here, I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that, that Europe will reopen its doors and allow Americans to come in. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I don't blame them for shutting the gates right now. Um, yeah. I'm not sure we want Americans to come into uh, our, our hometown until we start growing up and, and uh, behaving in a responsible way. Yeah. But let, let's all plan to uh, uh, meet at or near the Marriott uh, and the conference center. Okay. Thanks very much for this uh, interview. Odd, uh, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, see you. See you.